we use the word fan. You know, we want them to be fans of us. But, you know, that respect is reciprocated. The reason why. This is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. I'm Joshua Stike along with Luke Acri. And our guest today is John Turner with over 25 years of experience in the financial and insurance industries. John has a list of accomplishments to his name, including growing production from startup phase to $250 million in Ooh. annuity sales within three short years, working for an IMO where he created a system to grow the annuity business from $300 million to over $750 not, not million. Not bad. And spending 13 years with Charles Schwab, where he managed over $180 million in assets under management. As a senior executive in the industry, John's mission is to continue to be a catalyst for inclusive change while creating technology that will revolutionize how we do business. John, welcome to Stay Paid. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. John, man, love having you on the show. It's been a while since we first met, but I remember in talking with Andrew, I was like, man, we got to get to know this guy more. Not only is he a mover and shaker in the industry, his energy is just so good. Love it. Yeah, I yeah. love his energy. You guys should check out the YouTube video. He's smiling right now. I will tell you guys, we do have construction going on. <laughs> So if right you as hear the podcast, yeah, as started. the podcast yeah. is starting, Reminder Media is growing. Like, I mean, we're just we're just throwing up buildings. It's actually not for us. It's probably for our neighbors. But there's construction going on. So if you hear that, we apologize. But the show must go on, as they say. John, would love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Share a little bit of your life story. How did you have the success that you've had? Lead us up to today. Well, thanks, Luke. I think I've heard in the past that. Uh, we have similar backgrounds. My um, uh, my grandfather is a minister, mm. and so I uh, I grew up, um, you know, under under his tight thumb. Um, I learned in an early early at an early age uh, to how to present in front of people because of him. Uh, I can recall as a young man um, before I was even a teenager, uh, where we would have this youth week of prayer. And I pretty much was the youth speaker for the week of prayer. Nice. Um, and, and so the fear of public speaking and, um, um, and, and all that comes along with it was, was quickly taken away. Um, to that point, my grandparents um, really, I would say, uh, set that foundation for me. Um, and not only for me, but for my parents as well. Um, so. I first learned how to sell, believe it or not, going door to door with my grandmother selling Bibles. What? Oh, wow. Selling Bibles? I thought selling they, Bibles I thought they usually door. give out Bibles. So you guys were selling, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we were selling Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and literally the, the, the cases that they, they would carry these huge Bibles in there, they were really big Bibles. They were ginormous. Um, you know, they were heavy to carry around, but my grandmother would carry them door to door. And I wanted to prove how strong I was. So I struggled and carried those literally block by block for my grandmother. And I didn't want her to take it from me because I wanted to prove I was strong enough to carry these things. Mm. So I learned resilience early, um, you know, just from doing that. I learned how to sell. I learned how to take a no. Um, long before I probably knew how to read at a high school level. Um, and so I was selling literally at birth, um, um, the, um, from the time I could walk and talk, my grandmother had me, uh, in, um, in living rooms telling the story, um, and different Bible stories and they wanted their kids to do the same. And, uh, and that helped with the sales and she, you know, she was a great salesperson. She's since gone, um, as well as, um, uh, my, my, that was my maternal uh, grandmother, my paternal uh, grandmother and grandfather, um, very much the same. Um, and, um, and, and they own several businesses and companies. And, uh, and so that's where I got it from. Um, I since moved on, uh, went off to uh, college uh, within the same denomination as a private school um, and uh, studied finance. Um, and, Afterwards, got into the business, uh, managed assets with uh, Charles Schwab and Company, 
I had a great, great time there. I, I, I actually, I, I recall my time at Charles Schwab for others as, um, as the greatest learning period um, of my career because they're really sticklers about drilling knowledge into your head to help you manage clients' portfolios. And so that's why I really learned to cut my teeth for my professional world. And then off to a Wall Street distribution firm where I've spent uh, the past seven years. And so I'm just curious, right? So when you went to college for finance, did you know you wanted to go into the finance industry? Did you like, did you have it all set out in line or was it kind of random? You know, this is, a, that's another great story. Um, I, uh, I went to work with uh, my uncle who was international finance director for one of the big automobile makers in Detroit. Okay. And after going to work with him and seeing him place trades for the accounts, uh, I knew at that point in time that I wanted to be or do something along the lines of the financial space. And the more I, it, it, it opened up and piqued my interest. And at that point in time, uh, I then decided after doing some research, that was about 10th grade, that um, I knew I was going towards the Wall Street way, uh, more on the retail side than the institutional earlier in my career, helping individual clients. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, like, obviously, you're extremely successful in building out annuity-based sales, right? And started something that went to 250 million annuity sales, then did another business, 300 million to 750 million. So share with us a little bit about what you're doing today, your business, what you do, you know, kind of for a living. Yeah, yeah, that's... uh... It's, 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 it's going to be a pretty easy, you know, basically right now, um, working in the annuity space, what we've learned or what I've learned over a period of time is that annuities have always been one of those things that, as, a, as a financial advisor, portfolio manager, that, um, that's been a mystery to a lot of advisors and managers. Um, it's, it's one of those things that in some ways, those who don't like annuities just don't understand or know the benefits of them. And those that know the benefits of them, um, then that is the big separator. Mm. Uh, so so uh, now, so, so honestly, to answer your question, I have to back up a little bit. I started after portfolio management. I learned during the portfolio management time, especially during the downturn of 08, that those portfolios that had an element of a fixed index annuity to it actually performed two times, in some cases, three times better than those that did it. So if you remember that time frame, nothing made money. International. We, we remember that time frame. Yeah, we remember. <laughs> we didn't make any money either. <laughs> um, right. And, and in a lot of ways, we still have some blowback from that in our bank accounts. When was the last time we seen greater than 1% return right. on our cash at a bank or on a CD? Right. Right. right? Um, on money market rates. Uh, and so everything somewhat lost money. However, the benefit of a fixed index annuity stuck out like a sore thumb. Because while when the markets go down, they go to zero, right? So they don't give you a return, but they don't eat away. Yeah, they don't go at negative your, at your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so by helping advisors learn that story and learn where that product fits into the total client portfolio allocation, is how we've been able to grow the industry. Um, and that in, of the annuity space. Well, there's a golden nugget there before we move on uh, to talk sales marketing. There's a golden nugget on sales in that, in that I've always found, you know, features tell, benefits sell, but really in order to share benefits with somebody, you got to paint a picture and you got to share a story with them. I don't know the exact stat, maybe Ariel, you can fact check me you know, or whatever, but there is like a crazy stat out there. If you can share the logical numbers all day, and people won't remember them, but they'll remember the story 
that you right. share with them, right? So it's so important in whatever you're sharing, whether you're in real estate, insurance, finance, you can come at people like you're a real estate agent. You can come out with them with the CMA, the comparative market analysis. And here's why your home's worth what it is because this home sold for this and it was the same square footage, blah, 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 blah. But you got to really paint a picture for them and share a story with them because that's, that's right. what's really going to be memorable and move the emotion to get people to trust you and ultimately buy from you. That's exactly right. And we help advisors learn those stories. Um, uh, we help them and we tell them exactly what you just mentioned. You know, you have to learn the story to help your clients understand exactly what to get into. Um, because as you mentioned, no one's going to remember necessarily the facts and figures unless you guarantee something. They'll remember the pain of 2008 though. If they're, if they're old enough, they'll remember, remember, remember that. that. Yeah, exactly. And that triggers emotion. Look, people don't buy on logic. They buy on emotion. Like it has to logically make sense. People right. aren't, you know, dumb, but they buy and they move on. They a, justify on, emotion. on logic. Yeah. Right, right. That's right. So That's uh, right. share with us uh, a little bit about, because now you're on the leadership side, you're teaching other uh, advisors, you know, how to manage uh, their business and generate leads and kind of build those relationships that are so critical uh, to having a long-term business. What are you seeing that is is working and is successful uh, on the relationship side? Good. Yeah, on the relationship side, um, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, as we mentioned, you know, you kind of always want to have a reason to touch, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and again, one of the things that I'll share in detail even later in, in, in this conversation is that you want to have any reason to call. Um, and that's what works. Um, and, and so, uh, can you explain, to advise, can you explain what that means from a, like a lead generation standpoint or a technical standpoint? Like you want a reason to call, what, what does that actually mean? Yeah. So from a lead or let's go from a lead generation side. So let's say that, um, you know, in my space, I'm going to speak annuities because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, whenever annuity transaction happens, there's an application, uh, and then everything is submitted, uh, and, and then we wait for uh, the application basically to be approved or accepted by the insurance carrier or company. During that time frame, there is an opportunity for the advisor to touch base with the client instead of just allowing that to be dead space for that time. So there's a reason there to reach out that a very positive reason to reach out and talk to your client again, because you and I know that in starting this business, we can make a thousand calls just to find one good client, one great client. But then once we find that client, we're wrecking our brains. How do we get in front of another one just like that client there? And you're going to have a servicing challenge as well, because now that you have that one, now, prospecting and, and servicing, your time is split. So the best way to service is to follow up with a call and you tell them about where you are in that process. They trusted you. They obviously liked what you just did for them. And because they trusted you and like what you just did for them, now you talk to them about how else can I get in front of another great person like yourself. That's what I found has worked the best over my career. There's 101 ways that we could go about growing our businesses from infinity groups to a whole bunch of other things. But the number one way that you're going to survive and find longevity in this business is by getting your clients to refer you to additional business. Amen to that, man. There's so many golden nuggets in there. Finding a reason to call is such a good action item for people that you have currently in the buying process or in, where you're servicing them. And we interviewed, um, this is old school, like way back one of our first interviews, and it was a real estate agent. And I believe this lady's out in Colorado. I can't remember her name, so forgive me. But she basically said one of the biggest pain points for buyers and sellers is they want to know, specifically sellers she was talking about in this example, they want to know what's gone on with their house mm. constantly. But real estate agents don't update their yep. sellers very frequently and they don't set expectations for how often they're going to update their sellers. So what happens? The seller is left there going, my agent's not doing anything for me. Right. 
That's like right. what's going on, right? And you've worked so hard. You've called a thousand times to get this person to the deal, but they're sitting right. there left with a feeling going, what are you doing for me? Like, yeah, I haven't heard from you. So what she simply did in her business, which was a game changer, is she just updated. Now she chose to do it every day, I believe. Yeah. So you don't have to do it every day. What I would encourage people is set the expectations, but I love your model. You're basically saying, you can turn this into a way to generate leads. Just every chance you get, that's a reason to call it supernatural. Something's going on with the contract. You've, you've made it to a different phase in the process. Pick up that phone, reach out to that client. The other thing that- what, what was the language you used there though? You didn't ask for the referral, right? You said, how can I get in front of somebody Yes. How can I get in front of someone else that's like you, that's like yourself? Like you. Yeah, I love that line. It is. Yeah. And it triggers across um, reciprocity. We interviewed Jay Bear. And Jay Bear is a great interview for people to go back and listen to. And he talked about this idea of, hey, how do you get people to refer you? How do you get people to have an unbelievable experience with you? So essentially, they become a raving fan. And he gave the example of a podiatrist. Mm-hmm. And the simple example he gave was that this podiatrist's business was blowing up. So many patients, so many raving reviews. And when he went and researched, why is it that people literally will drive past two, three other podiatrists to get to this podiatrist? Like, there's nothing special about his service necessarily. He found right. out that the podiatrist was calling all new patients before they came in for their appointment. And he was talking to them, introducing himself to them. And the simple reason why it worked is because all of us, think about your doctor's appointments and stuff. We all expect to get a call from the doctor after surgery. We all That's expect right. it, right? Because they want to check in. How's your pain level? You know, right. how's the medicine? All this stuff. Everybody expects it. So it's not unique. It doesn't impact us. Everybody expects that. No one expects to get a call from the doctor before right. you even go and visit them. This podiatrist chose a reason to call in your words and he has created raving fans, which his business is blowing up because of it. So it's it's yeah. literally your what you're preaching in action in the podiatry field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and Luke, honestly, to that point, like you said, people expect that call. And in a lot of ways, because it's so expected, right? It almost feel like it's a liability call. Mm. Mm. You know, that if they don't, like they're checking in to make sure that you are okay for their liability purposes. <laughs> right. Yeah, don't don't find yourself as the business owner that's just doing liability calls. That's, that's the right. takeaway, maybe. We'll talk about that part a little bit then. After the transaction, obviously, what are you doing from a, you know, staying top of mind with those past clients, continuing to service them in, in a way, but also continuing to build those relationships? Yeah, Josh, that's a, that's a great question. You know, in the industry, there is a, um, from a financial planning perspective, there is a plan implement monitor. Um, uh, approach that we, that the advisors go through. Um, And so in speaking advisor language, that monitor piece is the one that, uh, that falls the most by the wayside Mm. because we feel like our job is done after we found a client, we created a plan for them. We implemented that plan for them. They gave us a great referral. Now we're done. Yep. Right. So you have, to con- you have to continue with that next phase of the monitor. So the monitoring process, how does that look? Well, depending on your practice size and things along those lines, you should be touching your clients at least two times a year. We did quarterly reviews um, um, and when I was an advisor out there. Um, but I would say you absolutely want to follow up at least twice a year um, and plan something with them. Don't just follow up with, you know, it, we, we use the word fan. You know, we want them to be fans of us. But, you know, that respect is reciprocated. The reason why you, you ask me, Josh, about that language I use, I want to find another client like you. Mm-hmm. I am a fan of yours. Mm-hmm. So as a fan of yours, we want to touch base a couple times a year. You might be a great center of influence for our practice. We don't know until we continue to build that relationship. And so at least twice a year, you know, get out with your client, do a lunch with them. You know, don't waste your calendar time. Look at your calendar. And if you have lunches open every day and you're not doing some exercise or something that's going to make you, you know, a little more vibrant to finish the day, 
then put a client lunch there. Put a beverage in the morning there. Touch your clients, become their fans, and then they'll become a fan of yours. Have you, do you do larger client appreciation events or is it usually the one-to-one? Because we've had, we've, I feel like we've been hearing more and more the value of the larger client appreciation, mm-hmm. whether that's a happy hour or it's a golf outing or anything like that. Have you seen success there as well? Yeah, we, we, we do a combination. Um, there is a big value in doing the larger client appreciation events, especially if you can get outside influences um, where they can get additional nuggets uh, from, you know, as it relates to the industry. Mm. Um, you know, uh, we did one in Vegas, um, a while back around fight around, uh, one of the big fights that were happening around there. And, you know, that was a big draw and all of them appreciated it. Um, it, you gotta be careful about choosing <laughs> venues. I was going to um, say, talk about liabilities, man. Vegas. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, 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 you gotta be careful. So we definitely chose the venue that was yeah. off. The you, you went back to selling Bibles when you did that event. You <laughs> oh, were like, man. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one point I would make is that you're referencing, at least I think you are, is referencing literal like physical type interactions. Like you're talking to that client, you're taking them to lunch, you're taking them for coffee. Maybe you're having a phone conversation with them, but it's a physical interaction. Because I would tell people from my experience Like you need to be like physically interacting with them two times a year and then you need to be dripping on them consistently. What we've seen is the most, I would say, return on investment is from like every two weeks trying to get in front of them with other pieces, right? That might be some email, some social, some print, some, you know, other things like that. So I wanted to point out to people that you're talking about every client should have two personal, personal interaction, interactions yeah. with you, which is huge. Most people don't do that. They just set yeah. up like, cause we are a drip marketing company mm-hmm. and a lot of people just set up drip marketing, but they don't understand drip marketing is just passive. Yeah. And passive is great. It keeps you top of mind, but you need proactive. If you really want to get the referrals, what are they, what are, is everybody going to rate, you know, call you, pick up the phone, call you and give you the referral? No, you got to go get it. The drip marketing is keeping you top of mind, but you got to make those phone calls. You got to take them to coffee. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. You have to follow those things up. Those things are good. The drip marketing is great, but it's better if you enhance it with technology where you can see when they open it mm-hmm. and you call them close to the time where they're opening. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. John, I want to ask you, cause we ask everyone that comes on the episode. Thank you first off for sharing your story and obviously all of uh, your great advice. But, uh, if you knowing what you know now, right. Kind of thinking of back through your career, through your life, what would you go back and tell younger John? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a loaded question, Josh. Um, one, I would definitely say stay the course. It's worth it. Um, you know, in the earlier days, in the earlier years, um, you know, not having a natural market for the... Uh, the area in which I've chosen to go into initially um, was a big challenge. Mm-hmm. And it's a challenge for um, many of us who are diverse in our backgrounds and ethnicity. Uh, and so initially it was, um, it was, it was, I, I chose to go the retail route instead of the institutional route. Um, because the retail route was just a bit sexier to me at the time. Mm. Uh, now it's kind of reversed. Um, you know, kids coming out of school are going more the institutional route, um, institutional sales, uh, and, and going the retail route, there was a big challenge early on on just finding a natural client base of individuals that had the dollars to invest and that would listen. Um, and so I would definitely say, you know, to the younger John, Stay the course. You'll be happy in the end, for sure. Love that. John, thank you so much for coming on today. Before we close out, can you let people know how they can connect with you? Yes. So um, the best way to reach out to me would be um, take a look at our website at selexbrokerage.com. Or you can uh, always uh, just shoot me an email at uh, jturner at selexbrokerage.com.
awesome. We're going to include uh, links to that in the show notes of this episode that you can get over at staypaidpodcast.com. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and looking for ways to support the show, there's two ways we ask you to do that. First is to head on over to Apple Podcast, drop us a five-star review and a comment to let us know how we're doing. And the second and the best way is to share this episode with a friend. Get this episode. How can I Get this episode in front of someone like you. Yes. That's really what I want to ask because I'm a fan of everybody listening and we would love it if you took a minute to share it. If you want to get a hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com or you can follow us on Instagram. We are at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, I'm Luke Acre. John, thank you so much for coming on. So many golden nuggets in there. We want to boil every episode down to give you an action item that you can implement in your business. And your action item is any reason to call. So all of your clients right now that are in the buying mode with you, they're in some phase in that journey. Any reason to call, how can you reach out to them, update them, check in on them, do the unexpected, which causes them to rave about you. They feel special and then ask them for the referral. They will reciprocate. Remember, the difference between top producers and mediocre producers in every single industry we've worked in is top producers take action. Take action on that today.